Verily, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We began by praising Him because He and only He is worthy of being praised. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send His peace and salutations upon the final Prophet and the most perfect Messenger, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As to what follows, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to, from what I hear is the last Texas Da'wah conference. Uh, and I wonder if they have any surprises for us with regards to that issue. But uh, I have been told and I have been tried to extract from the organizers, what does this mean? It's the last conference. And believe it or not, I tell you honestly, I am not in the loop. I don't know what's happening. Uh, why is this the last conference, etc., etc.? I am told all shall be revealed, inshallah, on Saturday. So I do not know myself what this has to do with the last conference. But in any case, so here I am welcoming you to supposedly the last, I hope it's not the last, in some sense or the other, conference and the community, sorry, the topic is about community. The community is here to talk about community. The topic, the theme of the conference is about community. And so when I was told that I'd be giving the first talk of the conference, I thought that it would be very interesting to give uh, more of a sociological talk, a talk that deals with the concept of community. And so we will start off inshallah with a very generic talk and then I will continue this talk later on. I think it's on Friday. It will be a part two of this very talk. Today what I wanted to start talking about is the ties that bind. What is it that makes a community? Every single human being by nature, human is a social animal. A human being is a social animal. Human beings do not live by themselves. Very rarely, and if they do, they are viewed as being strange people. They do not live on mountaintops cut off from people. They live in communities and civilizations, in societies. It is, the part, it is a part of the natural law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us upon. However, we also know that human beings, even though they are social animals, they do not socialize with each and every other human being. Simply, there are too many human beings to socialize with. Maybe once upon a time, maybe there would have been such few people that you would know everybody. But that would have only lasted one or two generations. That's it. Realistically, there are simply too many people to socialize with. Therefore, every human being has to make some very deep and profound choices. Who will I socialize with? What will my community be? Human beings pick and choose who to establish relationships with, who to have bonds with, who to feel an affinity for. And these bonds are so strong that upholding them becomes the most important obligation, the most noble duty. These bonds are so strong that they define who you are. Your list of priorities, your list of community defines who you are. It defines what makes you noble and what makes you ignoble. So in today's talk, what I wanted to do is to discuss some of the ways in which humans have divided their society. And of course, there are many ways to view this. And I wanted to concentrate only on three of them. There are three primary ways that I wanted to discuss. The first of them is the concept of tribes the jahili concept, the pre-Islamic concept of being a community with your qabila. And the second is that of a nation state. You are French, you are German, you are Swiss, you are American. And the third is the concept of a religious ummah. These are three communities. These are three communities and they do not exist in isolation from one another. Rather, they exist in simultaneous relationships. You are simultaneously a member of an ethnicity, a qabila, a group of people, a nation, a religion. The problem comes, how do you prioritize? The problem comes, which one will you choose at time of a clash? And when is there a clash? And we'll talk more about this in part two. Part one, we're laying the foundations and that's today. So we're going to talk about only three and I want to emphasize this is not an exhaustive list. Obviously, there are many other ways to define a community. 
But I'm talking about, and I would say, and I would defend, these are the three primary and the three most important definitions of a community. Your Jahiri tribal Qabila system, the modern nation state, and also the religious fraternal brotherhood of being with the Ummah. So let us start off with, one by one, what are, our, what are all these things? The first is a Jahili concept of belonging to a tribe. It's all based on blood relationship. You share a common ancestor. The Quraysh, they all go back to Fihr. The Banu Abdul Muttalib, obviously they go back to Abdul Muttalib. The Banu Hashim, they go back to Hashim. This is the first definition. The second, that of a nation state. You belong to a national identity, a specific geographic region on earth that has demarcated lines. This is France, this is Germany, this is Sweden, this is Switzerland. Depending on where you are, where you were born, which piece of paper you hold called a passport, you are identified with that community. And the third, of course, is that of an ummah, which means you believe in a specific group of doctrines, theological, ethical, legal, moral uh, duties, and this makes you a part of the ummah. These are the three paradigms that I wish to discuss in today's lecture. What is the origin of these three paradigms? Tribalism, Jahiri tribalism, is the earliest form of society. It is the most common throughout the world, at least for the first better half, or not the better half necessarily, but the earlier portions of human history. Human history, for the most part, has been characterized by societies based upon tribal systems. And this is not just an Arab phenomenon. It is an African, an Asian, a Middle Eastern. It is a Mongolian phenomenon. Every single group on earth, even here in America, how did the American Indians divide themselves? It wasn't based upon geographical regions. It was based upon tribes. You had the Inuit. You had so many other different tribes. I can't list them off the top of my head because I don't remember any of them. But you all know which ones I'm talking about. Tribalism is the most, and it has been, the most common form of dividing a society. So it predates written history. We don't know when the concept of tribalism began because the earliest books we have, it mentions the concept of tribalism. Now even though this is the standard uh, way of defining identity for the majority of our human civilization, in our times, it has fallen into disuse. And it is in fact frowned upon by those who consider themselves to be more cultured. The more civilized they consider themselves to be civilized, I mean, it's all in general here, generic, the more civilized of society views tribalism as being backward. And of course, they view the nation state as being something uh, forward, if you like. Nationalism, what is the origin of nationalism? When did nationalism, nationalism start? Believe it or not, now we have been born in an era where everybody is defined by a nation state, whether they like it or not. You cannot live, even on the Antarctic, you are identified by a geographic region where you came from. Even if you don't want to, there are many American Indian tribes, especially in Alaska and many places in Africa, they don't want to be defined by the geographic region where they happen to be born in because they consider themselves as more belonging to that region than the people who rule over them. The Inuit Indians of Alaska is a case in point. Many of them don't feel American per se. This is their land. They've been there for 5,000 years. Here's this group that comes along in 1951. When was Alaska added? 50, 59, 59, 49, 1949. So here's this group of people who comes along and now we're expected to give up our identity and become a part of them. Whether they like it or not, they're Americans. They have been defined as being American regardless of whether they perceive themselves as being American or not. Now, we are, as I said, living at a time and place where a na nation state is the norm. There is no region on earth that is not a nation state, except if it be a contested nation state, like Kashmir. India and Pakistan are both battling over Kashmir. So it's not a matter, it's not a nation state, it wants to be one of the two or independent. It's difficult to imagine that the concept of nationalism is a very, very modern concept. To even hear this is strange. 
The word nationalism did not appear in the dictionary except for in the last century. The concept of identifying yourself to a stable geographic region on earth is a very modern phenomenon. And in fact, it began, the concept of nationalism, it was born, if you like, after the French Revolution. And it reached its peak, it solidified post-World War I. In our own century, basically, less than a hundred years ago. Because geographic regions were not solidified before this time. Even North America, look, it kept on adding states and states and states. Where we are right now in Texas used to belong to Mexico 150 years ago. So the concept of having a solid nation state is a very new concept. It's a very recent phenomenon. And as I said, it's solidified after World War I. In our times, this is the single strongest bond that is required of any human being. You cannot travel on earth unless you identify with this bond, even if you don't like it. And I can talk a lot about this, but that is a different topic altogether. I only recommend one book. If you, if you like, there's one book that I really would encourage you to read. It is called Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson. Imagined Communities is a very good book about the history of nationalism. And look at the title, Imagined Communities. In any case, so this is a recent phenomenon. A nation state is a very modern invention. The third concept, that of Ummah, of course we believe as Muslims that the Ummah has always been around. And in fact there was an Ummah at the time of Nuh, in fact even Adam alayhi salam. How many Ummahs were there at the time of Adam alayhi salam? How many Ummahs? Allah says so in the Quran. Mankind was one ummah. There used to be only one ummah. And then the first split occurred when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. When Allah sent the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, people accepted, others rejected. And from then on, there have always been numerous ummahs on earth. So we can say that the concept of ummah predates that of that of what? Tribalism and of course nation state. In fact, the original society envisioned by Allah is an ummah. This is the original society. So we believe as Muslims, and this is a theological point, you cannot prove it sociologically, historically, anthrop anthropologically, you cannot prove it. This is a theological doctrine we believe as Muslims. The original division of this world is an ummah division. So it began from the beginning of man. But of course, our ummah began with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And remember, one of the primary charges that he was accused of sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one of the primary, in fact, to be honest, the primary charge that was more sacrilegious than not worshipping the gods. You have broken our society. Our nation state our qabila, our tribal system, you have come and broken it. This is the number one charge, that you have a different conception of community. We have a community, Quraysh versus Hudayl versus Thaqif. You come along and you combine people from the Quraysh, from the Hudayl, from the Thaqif, and you form a Muslim ummah. You're breaking our bonds. Instead of being a Qurayshi, this person identifies as a Muslim first and foremost. And in the battle of Badr, Qurayshis who are Muslims are fighting Qurayshis who are pagans. Unprecedented in the history of Arabia. Unprecedented that people of the same Qabila are on opposing sides of a battle. You are breaking our tradition, our nation, our state, our community, our Qabila. So for us, the beginning of the Ummah begins with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though it came even before that as I said from the time of uh, the Prophet Nuh Alaihi Wasallam and I cannot see am I here or not yes okay origins is this origins or no founding myths now yeah so founding conceptions how do these three communities view their genesis we have talked about when they began how do they view their genesis? It is only natural that each of these communities considers its genesis